is sections 12.1 through 12.4. Again, it's pretty much all of chapter 12. Okay? Quickly, just to look at the uh, topics within the chapters. 12.1 was Hooke's Law, okay, which gave us this formula. Okay, that was the first formula we started with, Hooke's Law. <coughs> Section 12.2 was Simple Harmonic Motion. Okay, and that was three formulas given. Omega equals 1 over tau. Tau equals 2 pi square root m over k and tau equals 2 pi square root l over g okay make note please this is a mass spring system okay so what are we doing for the differentiations between l and i and length the under the script l means l okay and, what is that and that's a one up there okay. Can we write our ones like one? sure Okay, you're gonna see the number one. It's uh, it's typed, so you'll see that on the test. Obviously, it's a one. Okay, the L will look like it's italicized on your test. The L will look like this. Okay, that's what L looks like italicized. Okay, so you'll see the L italicized L over G. Okay, whereas here you'll see the one with the actual cap here and a flat I. You're gonna see a little curve. Uh, there's one other formula. Last one. V equals omega lambda. Velocity, or speed of the wave, equals the frequency of the wave times the wavelength. This was, this was from section 12.3. So again, we're going to go over all of it, guys. Relax. Grouping it by section. Okay? There's no formulas from section 12.4 to remember. What is 12.4 again? Say again? You just said there's no formulas. Wave interactions. Oh, interference and pulses, yeah. There was one other thing that we talked about. It's not going to be given as a formula because it's just a relationship. And it was that the energy <coughs> produced by a wave is about proportional to its amplitude squared. This is one you need to memorize over here. It's not a given formula because it's not a formula. It's a relationship. The energy of a wave is proportional to its amplitude squared. So if its amplitude is 7, and then the amplitude doubles, well, if you double something, you have to multiply by a factor of 4. If you triple the amplitude, it goes up by a factor of 9. If you quadruple the amplitude, the energy goes up by a factor of 16. Because whatever this factor is going up by, you have to remember to square it, because it's proportional to the square. The energy of a wave is proportional to the square of its amplitude. Are we going to have to use that in a problem or is it going to be multiple choice? I mean, we just It's not going to be a mathematical problem because that's not a formula. So it's got to be conceptual by default. But it could be for response, the conceptual, like the short answer, or it could be multiple choice, either one. Okay? I don't know. Give me the test. All right. Just give me the test. So, let's talk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to simply go through the stuff that you need to really know for this. Okay? First, we made diagrams in class. Like this. Okay? Where this is natural, and I did it in a different order in class. Okay? It does not matter the order I put them in. This is the natural length, which we call equilibrium. This is the stretch length. And this is the compressed length. Okay? I thought equilibrium is in the middle. I, again, it doesn't matter. I said I'm putting it in a different order. Don't let that confuse you. As long as it's in the middle, meaning this is the middle, this is stretched. This is compressed. Okay. Yep, you can call it free length, yep. Okay, you can call it, you can call it free length or natural length, either one. So, let's go ahead and think about what our diagram looked like in class. This was the equilibrium line. Okay, which meant that this is the stretch length. 
This is the compressed length. Okay. Now, in this first case, when the object is stretched, the x value is positive because it's pushed to the right. But the force pulls back. So the force of the spring would be negative. Keep that in mind. Okay. Here, in the bottom one, the x is negative. It's pushed back. But the force of the spring pushes to the right. So the force in the bottom example would be positive. Okay. Now, Gary. Imagine, imagine a spring. From like the center to yes, to the blocks. center, to the center, to the center. Oh, center to center. Actually, whoa, whoa! Wait, yeah. What's this whole? Actually, I didn't know that. Actually, like, okay. Center to if center. an object is pulled this way, the x is positive. If it's pushed this way, the x is negative. Okay. That's our <coughs> displacement. No, displacement. Displacement. X is displacement. Remember that. Now, if this were in simple harmonic motion. Let's make believe I take the spring and I extend it. Okay, so I pull on the spring to stretch it to here. And then I let go. This is going to oscillate back and forth, back and forth between these two amplitudes. Do we see this so far? Yeah. So this X, we call it displacement, Jeff. But you could also call it the amplitude. So that's the square. Okay. It's, X, it's X plus, it's 2X, right? The amplitude is just X. So it's one of the displacements. So let's say the amplitude is You guys four. cannot talk at the same time. Displacement is 2X. Displacement, overall, from this point to this point, you could think of it as 2X, but the maximum displacement from equilibrium is X, which is the amplitude. Yeah. Jeff? Okay, but how does that relate to energy of the wave proportional to the square of its amplitude? Let's say the amplitude is 2X. The amplitude is x. The amplitude is literally from the equilibrium to the most extreme part. So this say, is the amplitude right let's here. Let's say you, you in the problem said it was like 4 by a factor of 4, so that would be 16 for yep. the energy wave? Yep. The energy created by this would be 16 times larger. And you know where else you can look at that, Jeff? Remember, potential energy equals 1 half kx squared yeah. from a spring. You would be squaring the x. That's where the square part comes in. It's energy, potential energy. Okay. okay? Anyhow, let's get to what we're going to go through here. At this point in time, when I let this go right here, what's the velocity before I let it go? Zero. Zero. Then it speeds up, right, because it's getting pulled back until it gets to here. It reaches maximum velocity. This is in your notes already. Then it keeps going until it stops again right here, right? Velocity is zero. Then it goes back this way. Then the velocity reaches a max again, or the speed, sorry, reaches a max again. Then it slows down, it slows down, it slows down, it stops again. Velocity is now zero. Okay, know the transfer of velocity as it moves in simple harmonic motion. Same thing with the pendulum. At the top, the velocity is zero. At the bottom, it's V max. Then it rises up until velocity is zero in its potential energy. Then it drives back down where the velocity is max with all kinetic energy. And then back and forth. Uh, Garrett first, then Jeff. There was a question in the problem set uh -huh. that talked about the swinging of the pendulum and where the accept it was like a conceptual problem and it asked I think like if the acceleration in a swinging pendulum is ever zero is it is the acceleration at the bottom zero like well, when it's swinging when it reaches the like exactly in the middle is that is the acceleration zero which acceleration acceleration acting straight down the acceleration of it, it there are two different accelerations there so, like, you're talking about the angular acceleration of the object? Yeah. No, no. I used to have a book in here, but I lent it to somebody. No. No, I know who has it. It's not, it's not a junior. Um, bring it to office hours after school. Just bring it to the We'll look at it, okay? Jeff. Uh, you can assume that when it's going from zero to the maximum speed... It's accelerating and then it's decelerating when it's going to the yeah, it's, other it's, zero. Like Correct. Oh, wait, I, I, I so here it's accelerating in the negative direction because the spring is pulling it back this way, right? right? But, then but then once it hits the equilibrium, it stops accelerating for a quick second because it's at equilibrium. Okay. Then it goes this way, so it's pushing back this way, right? So it's a deceleration and a positive. So here it's negative acceleration. Then it gets here, there's no acceleration because it's at equilibrium. 
and then until it gets to here, it's going to act with a positive acceleration because the spring is pushing it back. Oh, but it's zero acceleration because it's at equilibrium in the middle. Velocity. No, because it's at equilibrium, not because of maximum velocity. But why is it? Because aren't you increasing the speed? Why is it deceleration? You're increasing the speed in the negative direction. Oh, so that's why. But then yeah. on the other half, what are you doing? You're decreasing the speed, but in the positive direction. So you're just accelerating. Exactly. Okay. So it's on the way back, extent, it's though. negative acceleration because the spring is pulling back. Just think about the force and the acceleration. Guys, this is a very good question. It's definitely on your test. Okay, think about the force and the acceleration being uh, vectors. So if the force is pulling it back, Jeff, when it's stretched, right, then the acceleration must also be pulling it backward. So on, whenever it's stretched, the acceleration is negative. When it reaches equilibrium, it's not stretched. There's no force acting on it, so the acceleration up here is zero. No, absolutely not. When it's at equilibrium, the spring is not stretched for an instant in time. Not on a mass. We're talking about its linear motion, right? Force of gravity acts up and down. That does not affect the mass. No friction. I mean, we we always done this like this way. If there's friction involved, absolutely, there's a force. Sure. But Fernando, we've been talking about simple harmonic motion where it's frictionless. If friction were involved, none of these equations we've used this the whole chapter would be valid. Say again? The only place there's force is when you pull. Or when you push. So here at the bottom, when it's compressed, the force of the spring is pushing back. So there is acceleration when it's compressed, but now it's positive. But you're talking about the acceleration of the spring. What are we No, the acceleration of the mass. <laughs> Acceleration of the mass. But, but the, the spring is pushing this way. Is going the, spring. the spring is pushing this way on the mass, so the mass feels a positive acceleration. The spring is pulling to the left on the mass, so the mass feels a negative acceleration. The spring is not doing anything in the top, so the mass feels no acceleration. Okay? Think about force and acceleration always being in the same direction. Okay? Let's go on. Know your terms. I'm not going to go over them all, but no period is the time it takes for one cycle. Frequency is the amount of waves per unit time. Amplitude is the maximum displacement from equilibrium. We've defined them all. I'm not going to define them all again. Look in your notes. Um, let's see. How about this example? If the length of a pendulum is halved, what happens to its period? Should I ask to look at that? If the length of a pendulum is cut in half, what happens to its period? Okay. No, be careful. Close, close. Two root two? One radical two. What is one half? You said radical two, radical two. Let's go over this. It's not one half, but you're on the right track. It's two over two. So it's right quadrant one. Wait, I'm pretty sure it's just radical two. It's not going to be two. You're closer with the first part, but you said your statement wrong. Okay? I'll explain. Hold on. Let's take a look at this here. If we have the length, this is what happens, right? Do you all agree? Yeah. Okay. Now watch, 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 come on. Isn't that the same thing? If I put a half in the numerator, it's the same thing as dividing by 2, right? So I'm just going to split up the 1, put the 1 with the L, put the 2 with the G. So again, this 1 stays with the L, the 2 goes with the G. Now, write this like the following, please. It's the same thing. Again, if I take out the radical 2 out of the bottom, you're left with L over G under the radical, so take out the radical 2. So really, if you want to say it the way you said it, you've got to be careful though, because you said it incorrectly. This value tau decreases by a factor of radical 2. You said radical 2 over 2 at first. Radical 2 over 2. If you're going to use radical 2 over 2, it's different. Okay? So be careful there. So it decreases by a factor of radical 2. Because why? It's in the denominator here now. Okay, it's in the denominator. 
It's not going to be exactly like that, but you need to know how to do that kind of stuff. What happens if the gravitational force doubles? Say we're on Jupiter, where the gravitational force is approximately four times as big. Now you have a 4G here, right? So this 4G would be here. Then you would take out the 4, it would be radical 4. But what's radical 4? So you could say it decreases by a factor of 2. Okay? So you need to think about this kind of stuff as you go through it. All right? So you have to like Yeah, one of these will definitely be on there. Maybe not, maybe just not just one. Maybe not two. Yeah. Because I would know to put one half. You're not solving for anything, Jeff. You're looking at the discrepancy of the change between this. Can we do another one? You're looking at the difference between this and this, Jeff. What's the only difference? Well, so what I could do on the test is I would put in fake numbers for You could do that, but that takes so much more time, Jeff. Look how easy that was for me. Much less time. No, 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 watch, ready? If the length is half, we start by putting in the one half L. Okay? Then we take the one multiplied by the L, the two really goes in the denominator, because it's in the denominator, it comes here. Yeah, I understand then I break up two and G as root two times root G. So I write it separate like this. Okay? You can do that. It's laws of radicals. That's why you learn this in algebra one and algebra two. Why do you put it under the okay? root two pi? Because now I can see, watch what happens. Look at the only difference here. What's the only difference in these two numbers, Def? There's a rad radical in the denominator. denominator. So this period decreases by a factor of root 2. Why does it decrease? Because it's in the denominator. Okay. If this radical 2 had ended up up here, then you could say it increases by a factor of radical 2. All right? So it decreases by a factor of radical 2. I mean, how many takes that long? No, but then, you know what you have to do at the end? You're going to get a decimal value. And you're going to say, it decreases by a factor of radical, or, or by a factor of 1.1415. And that's not incorrect. Which is radical 2, so I get what you're saying, but you want to be really precise with your answer and leave it in radicals if you're really going to uh, capture what's going on here. Okay? I might say, the length increases by a factor D. Let's do that of a pendulum increases by a factor of d. So start by what your normal formula. D. Yeah, just the letter d. Okay, so that's what you have to do. If the length increases by a factor of d, and you want to know what happens to the period, you just put a D in there instead of the one half. Okay? Now you have to think about taking the D out. See that? Remember, D times L can be written as root D times root L. So what's the only difference here? Yeah, there's a D here, and there's no D there. So what would happen in this case, instead of decreasing by a factor of root 2, this is increasing by a factor of root D. This is where you can't use numbers anymore. Okay? You see the difference here? Okay, so keep that in mind. I'm telling you now. So this would increase by a factor of root D. With G? Put a 4 in there, and it would be root 4. You put a 4 in for D, this would become a root 4 here, which is just 2, so the period doubles. Okay, Mosh. How do you know it's root D? How do I know it's root D? Because I take the two of these, ready? I take this, and I take this, and in my mind I divide them. Everything cancels except for what? If you divide this entire thing by this entire thing up here, 2 pi cancels, Root over G cancels, yeah, you're left asking, with just root D, right? She's asking, how do you get from the entire root of 2 pi uh, through a DL over G no, to... No, she's not. Yeah. How do you know that what? Because, again, you want to know what is the difference between this equation, Masha, and this equation right here. What's the difference, honestly? Root D, right? So if I said to you this... You start with some quantity x, and it goes up by a factor of 7. How would you write it? Seven. So what's the only difference, Masha? Seven. So what's the only difference here? Root d. Root d is the factor. It's the same thing as putting a 7 in front. Okay? Again, 
If you increase the value x by some quantity 7, you would make it 7x. The only difference is 7 there. Well, the only difference here is this root d not being there. So this from here to here goes up by a factor of not 7, but root d. Okay? Which is a number. Say d happened to be 5, then you would just be the square root of 5, whatever that is. Okay? It's whatever the problem gives, okay? It stands for d. Some dilation, if you will. That's really just over 1, right? Like square root d. Yep. Okay, so you're just, again, separating mm -hmm. in a radical, you're allowed to do that. Absolutely. This is really over 1, and if you multiply it back, you would get back up to here, which is what you had. Okay? Let's press on. Um, know your types of waves, longitudinal versus transverse, and the difference. Okay, remember transverse. The wave, the particles vibrate perpendicularly. Longitudinal, they vibrate parallel. Can you give an example of uh, transverse? Transverse? The rope. Okay, the rope is trapped a spring when you send a pulse this way. Uh, it sends a compression down the spring. There's another question the problem said, and it was... Quick, because we're running out of time. It was doing the same thing that the rope was doing, where you send like, a pulse through it, but it was a spring. And it asks, is it transverse or is it longitudinal? Is it both? It depends. Are they also sending a pulse this way, or is it just vertical, vertical the oscillation? Picture, the picture shows it's vertical oscillation. But if it's vertical oscillation, then there is some point in the spring where it's pulling. It's probably going to compress also. So you could say both for that. That'd be fine. I would accept that, yeah. Talk to him after. I'm not going to repeat, guys. Yeah, that's a pretty difficult question. All right. We got the next one. What about... What about constructive versus destructive? Jeff, come on. Oh, that's the test. What about constructive versus destructive? Constructive has uh, the same sign as well. And destructive, it has different signs. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Positive against negative. Can you say like that? Can you add these points like we did yesterday? Okay. However, however, again, though, if you add two, two opposite directions that are constructive uh, in interference, then it creates a bigger. Creates one big pulse, <coughs> two little ones. Yep. And then they pass through each other and they continue afterward. Oh, I saw the oh, right. project. But if it's, if it's, it looks so cool. It's easy. You can do, do it. it. Yeah. Do it. Wait, wait. Just, I just put like marshmallows in the Yeah, whatever you want. Ask me after. Let's go. And if it's destructive, the two cancel out. Correct. Guys, let's go over this again. Imagine we have, imagine we have this. Okay. Let's say one wave. Okay, let's say one wave looks like this. We're not sending a wave down a, a ro rope anymore. Let's say we actually see the sine curve of a wave. So let's say this wave looks like this. Okay, and then wave two looks like this. Okay, so wave one is the orange line. Wave two is the blue line. And the question was... You know, what is the re give a sketch of what the resultant wave might look like of these two. Ooh, that's okay, so just look at their amplitudes, please. Take a look here. So that would be like this is some positive value in zero. So if you added this positive value and zero together, you're going to remain at the positive value. But then what happens here? You have a negative value and a positive value. So they're going to kind of cancel each other out. So it's going to start to diminish a little bit here. Okay. Until it starts to increase like this, because you would take this zero value and this value and add them together and they would remain here. Okay? Yeah. For this, if you give like a question like that, actually sketchy, can you just give uh, like fake values for each wave? Sure, give a value for each peak and stuff and add them, yeah. This wave would be like 2x minus x. Yep, so you can give peaks. So like this would be the result there. This result will go up a little bit. These might cancel each other out. So eventually you'd get some wave that looks something like this, right? So at every intersection? Sure, at every like point in time, give them a number if you want, yep. Okay. So here at this point, you're adding a negative wave in zero, so it's got to go down. This one is a little negative, so it's going to drop below it. Okay, until they're actually equal, stop. <laughs> These waves are both negative, so it's going to drop dramatically now. And then come back down until there's zeros. Okay? 
So this is an example of mixed because sometimes, look, in the beginning, don't you notice that one is above and one is below? Yeah. But then suddenly right here, aren't they both above? Yeah. Then above and below, then they're both above, then above and below, then they're both below. So whenever they're on the same side, it's constructive. Whenever they're on different sides, it's destructive. Yeah, so every like, you know, every vertical, draw like a vertical line, Paul, like this, ready? And you'll see that this is above and this is below. So that's an example of destructive at point A there. But here, at point, like say, let's say point C, this is below and this one is also below. So that's constructive because they're adding together because they're the same sign. So at point A here, at point A, this is an example of destructive because they're on the opposite sides. But this would be an example of constructive because they're on the same sides. So you have to be able to just look at a graph and read that. Okay? Just be able to read that. No. You have nine multiple choice. Yeah. Before you leave today, set it up. Not right now. Before you leave. I know. I only have one for you. He said. You know what's settled now? I've actually I'm trying to get some room. Up there. Know your definitions, please, of waves. Know, uh, know about your ropes, please. Definitions. Like periodic wave, pulse wave, mechanical wave. Know what those are. One at a time. I can't answer all three of you. On the top of one wave and the other is the crest. The top is called the crest. The bottom is called the trough. From the top of one crest to the next crest is called the wave. wavelength. What's the node? Does the size of oh, you guys can raise your, you guys can raise your hand. Fernando? Thank you. Uh, what's the ratio of the wave to the wavelength? Is it like 0 to 1? Yeah. Or is it like 0 to 1? What is a rope? You said rope. I mean, I rope, know. rope, rope. Yeah, I know rope. Like, I said know your know your like uh, characteristics of ropes. Like when you have a free end and a fixed end, if it slides up, if it sends an inverted pulse, if it sends the same pulse back. We did this in class with a diagram. Okay, that was twelve four. Twelve four. Amplitude. Please study your lab, okay? Please study your lab. Well, the lab is online. Read over it again and make sure you understand what you did. Obviously, I do have your lab. You're right. Thank you. All right. As far as mathematical problems go, as far as mathematical problems, I'm going to give you some because we're about five minutes away from the bell ringing right now. First, I'll tell you one of the problems is going to be the following. I'm going to tell you right now. Okay? You're going to need to determine... You're going to need to determine the K value for a certain spring mass. Okay? Given some information. Then using that K value, you're going to need to find the period. Okay? It's going to be a multi-part problem. First, you're going to need to find the K value in a problem. And then using that K value, you're going to have to find the period. So make up a problem or look in your textbook for one that was like that. Well, you said determine the K value. Jack. Jack. When it's negative K? The K can never be negative. I know, but so you just make the force negative, right? K can never be negative. You don't make the force negative. The force is negative. The formula is negative KX, absolutely. But K is not negative. Again. This formula is read f of x, f of s equals the opposite of kx. You just by you, to get k by itself, you go like this. You don't make force negative, Jeff, Jack, again, because of the fact that the spring force is a reaction. So if the force pulling is positive, the spring force by default is negative. If the force pushing is negative, the spring is positive, but then the displacement is negative. Remember, guys. Remember, if you have a mass hanging from a spring like this, if you have a mass hanging from a spring and the normal spring looks like this, without the mass, okay, your delta x, your delta x is the distance that the spring stretches. This delta x value is negative because it stretches down. The spring force acts which way? Up. So f of s in this problem would be positive, x would be negative. 
which is fine because your formula says this. So you end up getting a negative negative here. This will be a negative negative giving you a positive. Okay? Keep that in mind, please. Keep that in mind. Um, for like the determining K value in terms of the period, since you have to use the K value when you're determining the period... You need the K first. I know. I get that. But if you get the K wrong, can you take off points? No. If you get the K wrong when you do the period right, it's still right. Your answer for B is based on your answer for A. There's no such thing. I don't do double jeopardy. No. Okay? So if you get it wrong for part A, it's fine as long as you do the work right for part B. If you can't get part A, just make up a number for the answer and then use it for part B in your answer. Don't just not do part B, okay? Jeff. No, I was wondering what you think. Jeff. B equals omega or omega of the y upside down y thing. Tau equals 1 over omega? Is that what you're asking? No, the last equation you gave us. Yeah, we're getting there. We're not there yet. we, we got to still keep going. Please know the following. In this formula, or in this formula. Okay, in either of these formulas, make sure you're able to solve for G or K. It can be tricky. We did it in class. I'm not going to do an example right now. But know how to get the denominator. That's the tough part here. Okay? What if we're on another planet and I ask you to find gravity? Or what if we're trying to find the spring constant K of a bed? Okay? Again. Listen. Listen. Please, please listen, guys. Make sure you're able to solve something under a radical. So you need to be able to solve for L, M, K, or G in these formulas. Practice it. Do not just come here tomorrow and think, I know how to do this. That's a little bit tricky. We did it in our notes. Okay? Next formula. You just divided by a radical, right? Or you square. No, there's a lot to do with that. There's a lot to do. Look in your notes. Look in your notes. If it's not clear, come after school for office hours, please. We have a minute left. Jet, Paul. Can't hear him, guys. Hypothetically, would L would length over gravity be the same thing as mass over K? Yes. It's the exact same idea. Yep. They're analogous for one another, to one another. Oh, okay. okay. Numerically, they might be different numbers because the yeah, problem changed, but it's the same thing, yes. Oh, okay. So if you can solve for one denominator, you can solve for the other. So if you can solve for K, you can solve for G, right? Yeah. If you can solve for M, you can solve for L. So like hypothetically, like... Could Practice one of them. Do that on the yeah, it doesn't really matter. As long as you know what you're doing. Again, this formula, units are important. Meters per second. Hertz. Meters. So we have, write it down if you don't know, speed equals frequency times wavelength. Speed equals frequency times wavelength. Okay? Please know how to use scientific notation. We did it in class. Okay? These examples involve scientific notation. I tell you now, there will be it. Know your prefixes. Okay? Know for sure uh, kilo and mega. So if you have kilohertz, know that it's really 10 to the third. If you have megahertz, it's 10 to the six. If you just have hertz, you don't have to worry about it. Fernando. Just know those two. These are ones that come up a lot, and you just, you're going to see it in the next few weeks. I'm telling you now. Okay? When we took it things for electricity, we're going to see kilo and megahertz a lot. So you should know those prefixes. It's just whatever the number is, yeah? Why is it 10 to the 6? Mega is 10 to the 6. If you know the oh, Kilo, yeah. mega, giga is 10 to the 9, terra is 10 to the 12. Think about computers, right? You start with kilobytes, <coughs> then you get to megabytes, then you get to gigabytes, then you get to terabytes. They all go up by threes. Yeah. It's 3rd, 6th, ninth, 12th. Um, One more, hold on, before you ask. Last two. Remember the example with the bed and the different springs and there were 20 springs on the bed? And you had to find the overall K for one spring? Read through that example. Okay? It's not going to be the same, but the same idea. Okay? Same idea. Where is that from? In your notes. Yeah, hold up. Give me a minute. I'll, I'll call you up in a second.
Yeah. Hey, Jeff. Uh, on that one or no? Yeah, on that one. All right, let's go back. 